Number one, snow walk. I had a really weird experience years ago during a snowstorm. It had begun snowing earlier in the day, and the snowfall simply got thicker and thicker as the day and the evening wore on. Anticipating the snowstorm, my job had canceled the workday, so I had been home the entire day. I am not really the type of person who likes to be indoors all day, so by the time I got later in the night, I began to get a little stir-crazy. I was watching the snow from out of my apartment window, hemming and hawing over whether I thought it was a good idea to take a walk in the snow. There didn't seem like there would be too much in the way of visibility. It really wasn't the smartest thing to do, to walk out in a storm like that. However, you know, I was bored. When I got outside, the first thing that I noticed was that strange, almost calmness and lack of wind that you very often get while it is snowing hard. I mean, I'm making the assumption that all of you have experienced this before, and I don't know that for sure. But many times for me, when I have been outside during heavy snowfall, it seems like there isn't much wind. And then, the wind tends to come in full force after the snow stops and the sun comes out. I don't know, I always found it strange and yet calming which was the point I was trying to make. The snow had piled up pretty good by that point. There was at least a few inches of snow, and there was also a satisfying scrunch as my hiking boots pressed down into the virgin snow. I always liked that feeling. Although I wanted to go for a walk, I also knew that it wouldn't be a good idea to get too far away from my apartment. There didn't seem to be any end in sight for this hard snowfall, and the more it piled up, the more difficult it would be to walk in. I decided that I would walk a couple of blocks from my apartment building over to a pharmacy that I often frequented. I would go there and get myself a drink or something, and then head back home. The walk there was pretty uneventful, but there was someone there that I thought I may have recognized. If you've ever seen someone, and you sort of know you have seen them before, but you cannot quite place them, this is exactly what I was feeling when I saw this man at the store, and I figured that he must have recognized me from somewhere as well. He followed me around in the store a little bit, and you know how some stores have slanted mirrors on the corners of the ceilings? I caught him watching me more than once in those mirrors. I was not really nervous, unnerved, or whatever you want to call it, just from catching him watching me. For me, it was nothing more than just being curious as to who he was. One of the most aggravating things is just barely being able to recognize someone, and ultimately not being able to put two and two together. I bought some hot chocolate to make when I got home, so I could keep watching the snowfall. I got something to eat too, although I don't remember what. But I left the pharmacy without figuring out who the person was. I started on the way back to my apartment. As I walked along, though, I don't know what it was, but something made me turn around and look back down the block. Keep in mind that the visibility was very bad, since the falling snow was so thick. But I noticed someone walking behind me, about a half a block or more away. And of course my mind started playing tricks on me. Part of it was trying to make me think that it was definitely the guy that I had seen in the store. And that was plausible, actually because I hadn't encountered anyone else walking out in the snow that night. Plus, he was paying very close attention to me in the store. And also, I think the person following me was the same size as that guy was. I tried not to think about it, but of course that just made me think about it more. I began to get pretty nervous, shooting glances back several times. If it was that guy, and he was following me, then obviously he would know I was aware of it. So I was nervous while I was walking along. However, the one thing that gave me a little bit of calmness was that he never began walking faster, and he never caught up with me. The man did, however, follow me all the way over to my apartment building. I got in, closed the security door, and did not look back. I simply went into my ground floor apartment and didn't turn on any of the lights. I was thinking by doing so 
that if he was out there watching, that would be a dead giveaway as to which apartment I was in. I think I let about five minutes pass before I did anything. Still not turning any lights on, I just peeked through the blinds in one of my windows. This time I was able to confirm it was the guy I had noticed in the pharmacy, and he was hanging outside my building in the snow. I watched him smoke a cigarette, paced back and forth in the light of a street lamp, and in the moment he was done with the cigarette, he lit another one right away. The man did not notice me watching him from the window, and that was when I finally recognized him. Five years earlier, when I was in college, I was at a party at a frat house. I had stumbled into a bedroom by accident where a guy had forced himself onto an unconscious girl. He had been arrested, and my catching him in the act was a main part of him getting convicted and going to prison, and this man had followed me home from a pharmacy, likely recognizing me long before I recognized him. And now he was standing outside my apartment building, probably watching for me to turn the lights on or to look out at him. I didn't either. I also didn't call the police. I figured I was safe in my home, and he hadn't really done anything to me yet. I just kept the lights out, and never made it obvious that I had entered that apartment. Eventually, although it took a while, the guy finally left. The following day, the apartment manager informed everyone that one of the ground floor apartments had been broken into, and a man was arrested. Yes, it was the guy who had followed me home, and he had entered the apartment of one of my neighbors while they were sleeping. Fortunately, no one was hurt, but that man did another stint in prison for what he did. Number 2. Snow Hike I noticed that people do a lot of hiking and camping stories on the scary channels on YouTube, but I don't really ever hear scary winter hiking stories. I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person who could have experienced something like this, but a good friend of mine and myself went on a mountain hike years ago and had a pretty terrifying experience. I understand the number one knock people have over hiking in wintry conditions. It's cold, and you're always going to be cold in some ways, but there are a million ways to keep warm and hiking in the cold. I don't need to go into that. I know that's not what you're here for. But I wanted to give everyone who might not be into winter hiking an idea of what it is like. My friend Joey and I are experienced winter hikers. We were very experienced when we went on this hike too, and it might have been that experience that helped us to keep our nerves during what happened. Either way, both of us are still here to tell the tale, so that at least is something very comforting to know. Plus, we have gone on plenty of hikes since then. Anyway, we were hiking out to a certain mountain. In the first few days, as seems to be the case in a lot of these stories, everything went along just fine. The weather didn't do anything out of the ordinary. We were fully prepared, and it was smooth sailing, or hiking if you prefer to try and use accurate terms. In the fourth night, we had found two trees that were absolutely perfect for us to set our tent up in between. And it was that night also that the weather took a first unexpected turn. We weren't supposed to get snow at all for the entire trip, but that changed that evening. We had seen the clouds moving in and it was quite obvious there was going to be some snow. Even with the snow coming, we had no reason to not feel good about our fortunes. With the trees where they were and the angle of the hill, we were going to be sheltered pretty good. So when we got into the tent, and got ready to hunker down for the evening, the two of us were still in pretty good spirits. Despite a little fear concerning the trouble that the snowfall was going to cause us, we were able to fall asleep pretty easily. I wasn't sure how long we had been asleep, when I felt Joey shaking me to wake up. When I got up, he told me to be quiet and to listen. When I did, I heard what I assumed to be an animal howling, but it was unlike anything I had ever heard before. It was a nasty and sorrowful wail that chilled me even more than the snow did. And the two of us had absolutely no idea what the sound could have been coming from, but it was definitely an animal. 
and like nothing we had ever recognized. We could have written it off as not too weird, until after about ten minutes of this howling, we began hearing these explosions. They weren't gunshots, they were just the strangest sort of explosions. I mean, if I had to guess, they sounded like a lot of grenades exploding. Both the odd howling noises and the explosions were moving closer and closer towards our tent. Over a period of about 20 minutes, we heard them getting closer, and we, of course, got extremely nervous. We were sure at one point that the howling seemed to be within 50 yards of us. Fortunately, though, the noises began to move away. They were definitely related somehow. We never heard what sounded like more than one creature howling, and each time it was followed by those weird explosions. Eventually, after about 90 minutes, we stopped hearing either. We continued our hike the following day. We looked for any physical signs supporting or explaining the weird noises we had heard that night, but we found absolutely nothing. To this day, we have never been able to identify what we had heard, and we have never heard it again. Number 3. Snow Drive I didn't get my driver's license until much later than most people in the United States get theirs. My family really didn't have the money for me to get my own car, and I was way too involved in trying to get into college and to try to get a scholarship to be able to work any job where I could make enough money to get my own car. So it wasn't until I actually went out to college and then got a small job that I finally had to get a license. Before having a license, I was dependent mainly on public transportation. I do have to admit, however, that there were a few times when I'd missed the last bus or train. Sometimes I would have to take very long walks, but the few times when someone pulled up alongside me on the road and offered me a ride, I would take it. Afterward, I would always tell myself that I was so thankful that if I was ever in a similar situation to give someone who needed it a ride, I definitely would. This happened to me when I was in college. I had driven into the city one night to visit the clubs, and I wasn't aware that at the time there was a snowstorm moving into my area. It wasn't until after a nice long night of dancing and hanging out, and then me finally wanting to go home, that I went outside and noticed how challenging this was going to be. It was snowing hard, and judging by the accumulation on the ground, it had been doing that for quite a bit. I hadn't had much experience driving in the snow, so I was doing my best to simply be as careful as I could. I decided to stay off the freeways and just take the back roads home. I was nervous enough riding on the freeways during good weather conditions. I didn't want to even try to do it during a heavy snow. After getting far enough away from the city, I was driving on a long stretch of road when I know someone hitchhiking on the side of it. I have to admit that I was a bit hesitant to pick someone up because I hadn't done it before. But then I remembered all those times that someone had stopped and given me a ride. And in none of those times was I ever in as bad weather as this guy was. So I pulled over and offered him a ride. At first the guy seemed pretty nice and grateful that I offered him a ride but I also noticed how he didn't give me a destination to drive to right away. I asked him a few times and he avoided the subject, talking about the weather and then finally asking me where I was going. I let him know the university I attended and that I lived in the dorms there. It was after I told him this information that he got quiet for a moment, as if he was thinking something over. The guy's demeanor and reluctance to tell me where he was going made me very nervous. I was now regretting having picked him up, recalling every scary hitchhiker story I'd ever heard in my life. Finally, after a long silence, the man told me that he was going to a friend's house. That friend lived in an apartment building in the next town. He then told me that he was headed over to his friend's place for a party, and wondered if I was interested in coming with him to the party. Well, it was like two in the morning by that point. We had driven a couple miles so far with him in the car. I totally didn't buy the story 
that someone was walking to a party the next town over during a bad snowstorm at 2 o'clock in the morning. That was just a fishy story. I told him I thought it was a bit late, and I really needed to get back to the dorms. I couldn't take the chance of getting snowed in. He kept pressing it, though, telling me it would be fun. He also began telling me that I could sleep over tonight and go back to the dorm tomorrow. And no matter how much I tried to keep telling him no, he really tried hard to convince me otherwise. When I finally got to the apartment complex that he was talking about, there were no apartments with their lights on. He tried again to convince me before giving up, thanking me for the ride, and then getting out. At first I felt relieved and was about to drive away when I saw the man reach into his pocket and draw out a pocket knife. He quickly moved towards the front of the car and made as if to stab the front tire with the knife. I had not put the car in park, so I quickly stepped off the brake and hit the gas, pulling away from the creep as quickly as I could. I saw him in the rear view as I took off. It didn't take me long to discover that he had punctured my tire. However, I rode on the flat for a while to try and make it over to a gas station. I went in and told the clerk what happened, and he called the police. I waited until after they arrived, and one of the officers was nice and even helped me change the tire. The police easily picked up the guy. He obviously knew the town, but didn't have a place in that apartment complex. They found him on the side of the road. I am not cynical enough yet to come away from the story with the idea that no good deed goes unpunished. I have tried to do nice things for people before it happened, and I continue to do nice things for people after it happened. However, I am a lot more careful about who I attempt to do these good deeds for than I was beforehand. Hey y'all, Kill Orange Cat here. If you like this video, please let me know by hitting the like button. If you're not already subscribed to Killer Orange Cat, feel free to click the subscribe button and the bell below, or wait for the icon of Ichigo to Cat that will appear at the end of this closing. Leave me a comment, and share the video with someone you think might enjoy it. If you have an original story you'd like narrated on Killer Orange Cat, please email it to the address included in the description. But most importantly, don't forget to make sure to check in your closet and check under your bed. Because you never know where a killer orange cat might be hiding. Good night.